Good morning. This is a reading from the book of Acts. Fellowship was at the heart of the church in the days following the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. A spirit of community and welcoming the stranger is present as they gather to praise God. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The gospel story comes to us from St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Having fellowship with Zacchaeus and his friends at his home is a sign of the kingdom. In this act, Jesus lives out his mission statement to seek and save the lost. Now Jesus was passing through Jericho. And as usual, there was a crowd around him, kind of surrounding him. And there was a man who lived in Jericho by the name of Zacchaeus. And he went to see who this Jesus was. So he was a chief tax collector. And Zacchaeus was also very rich. And he was also very short. And he couldn't see over the crowd. And he couldn't get through the crowd. But he had an idea. He ran down the road ahead of the crowd. And he climbed up into a sycamore tree because he knew Jesus was going to come that way. Well, when Jesus got to the sycamore tree, he looked up. Zacchaeus, hasten on down here, because I'm going to stay at your home today. Well, Zacchaeus hurried on down. He was glad to have Jesus come to his house. But the people grumbled. They were not happy. Because, you see, they said, Jesus, why are you going to the house of a sinner? They said this because Zacchaeus was a tax collector, and that means he was hired by the Romans who had taken over their country. And also, he had gotten rich by overcharging his own people when they paid their taxes. So when they got to Zacchaeus' house, he said to Jesus, I'm going to give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone, I'm going to give them back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to your house, for you are a son of Abraham. Because the Son of Man came to seek out and save the lost. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Well, we are finishing up our five-week uh, sermon series today on the topic of fellowship. We have covered a lot of ground. If we can have that first uh, uh, slide, uh, if we could. Uh, we started five weeks ago talking about the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. If you have kind of just dropped in today from another town, we want to bring you up to speed a little bit where, we're, where we've come from and where we're heading uh, so we talked about the passage on the left there on the screen, which is the Great Commandment. And then today we're really focusing on the passage on the right, what we call the Great Commission. And we've learned uh, that out of these two great passages, uh, five purposes come. If we can have the next slide, that uh, uh, are true not just for our church here, but also for your individual life. Because a church is made up of people, isn't it? So if a church has purposes, it must start with the people living out those purposes together. 
So right now, for example, we're living out the purpose of worship, as you see up on the top. That flows out of love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Uh, or as in a personal way, we can say, uh, you were made to magnify the Lord. That's one of your life purposes, is to magnify God through worship. Uh, and then ministry flows out of that second half of the great commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, or you were shaped for serving God. You have gifts, you have talents. Uh, a simple example, uh, you know, uh, maybe today or this week downtown, there'll be a Habitat for Humanity uh, group pounding away, building a new house, and, and they are sh doing ministry using their, their gifts. Then evangelism flows out of the Great Commission, uh, go and make disciples, uh, or you were made for a mission. I talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and then today we're focusing on this fourth one on the screen, fellowship, which flows out of the words, uh, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, he doesn't use the word fellowship in that little phrase, but that's how you join the church family. You become part of a family, or you were formed for God's family is another way to put that, and we'll unpack that today. And then finally, uh, discipleship, we celebrated that last week, uh, particularly at 11 o'clock when we had our confirmation service, uh, and uh, that flows out of the teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, uh, or another way to put it is you were created to become like Christ. So today we're focusing on that fourth one uh, about fellowship. Um, it's interesting that Jesus gives that the same prominence, it seems, as the other big things of evangelism and discipleship. You know, he doesn't sort of neglect it, but he m brings it in with those other ones. Um, and why would that be? Why would that be? Well, one way to put it is we are called to belong as Christians, not just believe. Uh, not just believe. You recognize uh, the guy on the left there. But remember that the Lone Ranger had Tonto. You know, we sometimes say, well, I'm a Lone Ranger or he's a Lone Ranger meaning that they just want to kind of do their own thing, right? You know, but let's remember the Lone Ranger had help uh, big time. He had Tonto, uh, and he had, uh, was it Silver? Yeah, I almost said Trigger, but that's somebody else, <laughs> right? Yeah, and then, uh, you know, a lot of us remember Simon and Garfunkel, especially this service, right, compared to the next service. <laughs> And, and they had many wonderful songs that we can all probably think of in our head. And, and one of their most famous one is, was, I am a rock, I am an island. And you see the words on the screen there. Uh, and I think that song was written about a breakup, you know, that one of those two had broken up with a girl and, and kind of, boy, that was painful, I'm never going there again. And so, I am a rock, my book's I have my books, my poetry, and so on. You can see the words up on the screen. But again, that is not what, how God has created us to be. Uh, be islands, be rocks that have nothing to do with other people, hermits, uh, and so on. Uh, even the monks had other monks to be with, right? Um, you know, about the time that that song was popular, I was getting ready to go off to college. I'm thinking about that this morning as all of these seniors, you know, are, are getting ready for graduation. And a lot of us that were at their parties yesterday and ate way too much cake and food. And, uh, but they're looking at their next step, aren't they, you know? And, uh, and so it kind of took me back to long ago when we didn't have parties like they do now, you know? It was a lot uh, smaller scale. But I remember in the August before I started college, um, I got a letter from a woman I'd never met named Carol. Now, two weeks ago, I talked about a man named Carol uh, who changed my life because he was involved in Navigators. And uh, when I was a freshman, he, he talked to me about uh, committing my life to Jesus. Uh, uh, and, but this other one, Carol's a woman, sent me a letter inviting me to a fellowship group called the Lutheran Student Center, 
or Lutheran campus ministry at Cedar Falls at UNI. And that letter really changed my life. I read it, didn't know who this Carol person was, uh, but um, that kind of got me over the hump. I had never been involved in Luther League in high school, never been in a Christian fellowship group at all of any kind, but it sounded kind of interesting. And so I remember the vividly, you know, school started on a Monday, and the night before, Sunday night, there was this, this meal at this place called the Lutheran Center on the corner of college and university in, in, uh, in Cedar Falls. And my parents dropped me off at the door, and I walked up the steps kind of with fear and trepidation, and my life was never the same once I went in that door because there was a group of young people and a wonderful campus pastor that welcomed me into a fellowship group. And we had worship, you know, every Wednesday night. We called it Vespers, but we also had a lot of fellowship, and we ate a lot of hot dogs and bad pizza and, and you know, Sunday night suppers and all of that that I found a group of people that were so different than any group I had ever been a part of. It was what we call fellowship. Now, for me, that whole story started, and for a lot of those people, with baptism. Uh, as we see on the screen, uh, in our baptismal service, we have the words that you, you see there. Uh, the parents uh, are reminded by the pastor in the words, by water and spirit we are reborn children of God and made members of the church, the body of Christ, living with Christ and in communion of saints, the communion of saints, we grow in faith. You catch that? We, we say this, these words every time and it just kind of blows right by you, but it's saying that when we're part of a group, we grow in faith. Hear that? It's right there in the, in the service. And then the one on the right there was, was done last week at 11 o'clock for these 18 eighth graders that were here in the, in the front row. And you notice the echo of the one on the left in the words that they said that are on the right, where uh, Miranda asked them, uh, do you intend to continue in the covenant God made with you in holy baptism? And the very first thing they say yes to is to live among God's faithful people. See that? Fellowship. Right out of the gate. Why is that listed first, I wonder? You know? Could it be that a eighth or ninth grader, or anybody for that matter, can't do the rest of it? And it's a long, tall list, you know, things like uh, proclaiming the good news of God in Christ, serving all people, striving for justice and peace in all the earth. I mean, who put that together? That is a big, impossible list in a sense without the help of the Holy Spirit, which is why the kids say, I do and I ask God to help and guide me because none of us on our own can even get started with that long list. You said the very same things when you were uh, eighth or ninth grader a long, long ago. Um, why does it start with the words about fellowship? Well, if you're not a part of a fellowship of some kind, how can you ever do any of the rest of it? How can you be encouraged? Remember the song we sang this morning, that wonderful old hymn, uh, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds? Uh, the words really speak to what a group like this can be for each other. You know, The sympathizing tear, the author puts in there, flows uh, when we have a deep loss. Uh, fellowship carries us through. We need each other to grow in our faith. That's simply put. And others have found that to be true, too. Lyle Schaller uh, is a, was a well-known, the guru of church um, uh, growth people and authors, wrote over 50 books on the topic, and he wrote the quote there you see beneath his uh, picture there. The more friendships a person has in a congregation, the less likely that person is to become inactive or leave. That's just how it is. Um, and we have a lot of ways that we have tried to provide you with 
ways to make friends, uh, small groups, uh, dinner for eight, just our architecture. You know, when we put this place together, uh, some of you remember the old church. Remember that narthex? You know, I mean, you walked out, and it was like from here to there, about. And you got to there, and you, get, you had to get out of there, or you'd get trampled after a service, you know? Or you had to stand way back against the wall and hope somebody doesn't knock over your coffee as you're trying to have... It was just terrible for fellowship, wasn't it? But that's how they built them back in the day. And then you think about what we've got right outside this door, you know, this really huge gathering space. And then we have round tables. You notice that? That was by design because round tables are better for fellowship uh, compared to a long uh, rectangular one, which most of us kind of grew up with. And there's all sorts of other groups. You know, I think about uh, quilters and knitters and uh, wood carvers. And in the process of doing your handwork, uh, there's a lot of fellowship going on, isn't it? I mean, the handwork is kind of beside the point. It's the being together with each other, uh, and you grow in friendship for each other. We've got now, you know, brewing up the Bible, and canoe trips, and Lenten suppers, and, and dinner for eights, and all kinds of things, and we constantly are trying to think of new ways to help you deepen your friendships with each other. And then Rick Warren on the right there uh, talks about how small groups, in his experience, are key to keeping people involved and helping those friendships uh, grow. He talks about how they close the back door of the church. Sometimes the church is sort of like a revolving door, you know. People come in when they uh, join, and then a while later they go back out the door and, and really don't often come back. Uh, unless they have those friendships uh, that uh, Schaller talks about on the left. Uh, so just imagine if, if kids went to Iwalu and weren't in a group. Imagine if they stayed in a teepee by themselves or a cabin. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, and so as the, as the staff come together this week, I think, isn't it, for staff training, uh, they're going to learn about small groups. Iwalu is based on the small group model. And so these counselors will, will help or learn about how to help these kids uh, who often don't know each other at all uh, make friendships over the week. Or one of the reasons our confirmation program does so well is because it's different from the way we had it when we were kids. You know, I didn't have any, well, my group was a small group. We had two in my class, <laughs> you know. That's the ultimate in small groups. But today we have 18, or next year we'll have 30, I think, in the um, uh, graduate or the uh, confirmation class. And, and so you've got to break that down. You've got to break it down into groups of five or six with a guide, with a parent often or two, who help them to get to know each other. Or our high school edge group is maybe the best example of all. I, I got this wonderful letter from one of the uh, attenders of that uh, who... Who wrote, who's going to Malawi this coming Saturday, along with uh, a lot of other people. And he said this. This is a non-member, by the way. And he says, Edge is like a second home, a safe place, a retreat from the battles I face in high school. It's a place where I can be vulnerable and broken and praise the Lord endlessly. I am so blessed to be able to call this second home my church. Now, isn't that something? That's what fellowship can do. And you see that happening in today's lessons. I won't belabor the point, but in the Acts reading, uh, you saw all kinds of examples of uh, fellowship. We can have the next slide, uh, please. I've highlighted some of those uh, fellowship pieces in yellow there on the screen. Uh, they were devoted to one another, and they devoted themselves to fellowship and the apostles' teaching. And then we heard in that Zacchaeus story about how an offer of fellowship really changed his life, uh, as Scott told the story. You know, he came down out of that tree because Jesus said, I want to spend time with you. I want to 
have fellowship in your home. I want to come for supper. And, and nobody else was offering that to Zacchaeus at the time. No other rabbis for sure. No other leaders uh, of, uh, of Israel, but, but Jesus did. And that reminded me of, of this coming Thursday. We're going to go down, some of us, to Mission of Hope. That's pictured on the right there. Uh, and serve a meal to about 100 people. Maybe that'll show up. Uh, and, and we'll do that, but you know, one of the most powerful things is when the last person has gone through the line and you've given them the last bar or cookie or whatever, then it's time for us, or some of us anyway, to go sit with those guys. And that's where it really gets interesting when you, when you are vulnerable and you sit down and you try to get to know them and hear their story a little bit. Uh, and I think they're grateful that someone cares and wants to not just give them a meal, but also give them some love and get to know them just a little bit. Love is what it's all about, what it's all about. In some of the other passages in the scriptures, we see examples of uh, how relationships are at the core of, of our faith. Uh, the whole idea of the Trinity is a relationship uh, with God as Father and Spirit and Son uh, relating one to another. Um, uh, you see on the, on the right-hand side the, the famous quote from Genesis 1 of how God says, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. That's an example of what we're talking about, that we're called to be in community or in fellowship, uh, especially with a spouse. And then in the story that we're going to start in two weeks, uh, where Adam Hamilton will take us to the pyramids and other places, really that is a story about relationship, about God calling out of nowhere uh, a, a people called Israel, starting with Abraham, and then they end up in Egypt, and Moses comes along, and it's an amazing story. It's the core story. It's the, it's the gospel of the Old Testament, if you want to put it that way. It is as important to the Jewish people as uh, the story of Jesus is to us. If you don't understand Moses, Jesus, you miss a lot in the story of Jesus. And so we'll be thinking about uh, that. Uh, but we know that fellowship finally uh, is like a campfire. You know, this week at Iwalu, uh, uh, one of the things the new counselors, especially the brand new people, will learn is how to make a campfire, how to build a fire. That's pretty important, you know, if you're out on a canoe trip and, and they'll learn. Or I remember learning that there are kind of two kinds in back in the day when dinosaurs ro roamed the camp with me. You know, there was, a, there was this kind, which was called a teepee, you know, where you, that's where you have a lot of kids around a campfire at night, and you sing, and you, you know, that, you want to have that kind of a campfire with great big logs, you know, and you just, but if you want to cook over it, you make more like a square one, a log cabin, we were, it was called in our day. Um, but we also learned something that you just know. Fire has a tendency to go out, doesn't it? You know, you go to sleep around a campfire, you wake up in the morning, and there might be embers, but there's no campfire anymore. Fire has a tendency to go out. And the same is true in fellowship. We're going to have the last slide, I think. There's one more. No, I guess not. Um, in the early church, you found this very interesting word from Hebrews 10 where the author says, let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. You know, I love that verse, very honest. Even 2,000 years ago, they had issues with inactivity. You know, people just quit coming. And just like if you pull a log out of a campfire and sit it over here, Eventually, the fire is going to go out from that log. If you separate yourself from the body of Christ, doesn't the fire slowly maybe go out in your heart too? That happens, I'm afraid. Because love is what it's all about. We've got one last little clip I want to show you to kind of wrap up our 
are thinking about fellowship. We can have that, please. What does it mean to love one another? Is it an emotion of the heart, an act of service, a force of the will? Can love ever truly be defined? We think so often in simple terms, but real love goes much deeper. It strengthens the weak, helps those in need, lives in harmony with all people, and holds us accountable. Love means carrying each other's burdens, admonishing and instructing, showing compassion and feeling it too, spurring one another to good deeds, confessing and forgiving, building and maintaining trust, being of one mind no matter our differences. Love means accepting others for who they are and allowing ourselves to be changed in the process. So love holds us together, grafted by faith into the one true Christ, whose example compels us to love one another. Love one another. That's what fellowship is all about. Let's stand and sing our sermon hymn, In Christ There Is No East or West. 